Good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing today? Uh, welcome to my lounge. Uh, I put a lot of work and effort into this one. Uh, <clears throat> took pictures of over 200 records. Just to kind of illustrate the point I want to make here. Uh, first off, I want to thank my friend Jean-Michel, who I've referenced probably a hundred times uh, for allowing me to share some of his stories. And I think most of you seem to enjoy that. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to watch, he's a guy from Switzerland who promoted and met all the great jazz stars in the 90s and 80s. And he's been, he's sat on the knees of Count Basie and Duke Ellington as a kid. He just knows a lot of people. And we've become very good friends. And <clears throat> he's not only taught me a lot, which he does every time we talk, he also validates a lot of my feelings about the black experience in jazz, the social issues, the things these black men really feel, and what they don't often say, and what they share through their horns. Uh, he's validated a lot of that stuff that I'm at right on point. And I always kind of knew I was, because I knew I know, I know enough blacks from DJing in that community for a long time that I know how they really feel. They're kind of passive. They don't want to be confrontational or deal with race every day. But deep inside, it's something that still marks them and haunts them all the time. And these were much easier times than what the, the men in the jazz age went through. So I knew that same context had to exist in a, in a much stronger sense, in a way. And the music's always been that uh, release, that vehicle to exhaust this incredible weight that they carry. But uh, and thanks to John Michelle, it's been very a uh, great experience for me because because <clears throat> he's he's validating what I what I think think and feel, what I've learned. Uh, he's teaching me stuff. Uh, he's giving me perspective. He's taught me a lot about the, the European uh, value of jazz, and not even so much uh, from the, the European artists. Always taught me about a few guys like Guy Lafitte, you know. Uh, but it's it's more about just the the Americans that came over. And a lot of them who lived there forever, and just the impact that they had, and how valued they were, and treasured they were. I've been watching more documentaries lately about jazz. We got a smart TV finally, so it's easy for me to watch uh, YouTube stuff on the big screen, which makes it more enjoyable for me versus sitting on a little desk watching something. I, I just can't stay focused. But when I'm on my couch, relaxing, put a documentary on, I can I can kind of submerge myself into it more. But uh, it's uh, to see how in Europe they were treated like royalty and on talk shows and morning shows and radio interviews and uh, so much of the footage of these great men and women uh, sadly does come from the European atmosphere of uh, jazz. There wasn't a lot of late night shows interviewing Ella Fitzgerald here, you know. Uh, in Europe they were seen very differently so it's, it's, been, it's been great to broaden my horizons. Uh, next I want to jump into what today's episode is about. And I've come to have a huge collection, as most of you know. It's a lot of the major jazz labels of the golden era, of the 10-inch and the LP, up until about 1970. I've filled a lot of those discographies in. Some, complete, some completed, some are 90%, some are less than that. Jubilee's probably about 60% now of their 110 titles or so. But a lot of these labels I've almost completed, if not completed. And in doing so, you learn a lot about new artists. It, you, you end up buying a lot of artists you don't know who they are or their background story. Uh, you start off in jazz very much buying through the spider web of artists that come out from where you came in. So if you start with Miles Davis, it's Red Garland, it's Paul Chambers, it's Herbie Hancock, it's John Coltrane, it's Wayne Shorter. That's kind of the connections and the dots you make. And you work your way around that universe. And as I've collected deeper and longer, I've come to recognize that jazz has a number of really impressive universes. Just spheres of influence that have shaped generations of players. And uh, there's three main white universes that I've come to see. And there's others, but there's three main ones that most of the white jazz greats were from one of these three. I'm going to delve into this stuff as we go forward. Uh, 
But again, this episode took a lot of time to make. So I want people to know if they enjoy this extra effort and time, and, or if it's just, you're just fine with me just talking. <laughs> but uh, I, I'm fine with doing both. You know, I've always got something to talk about. But uh, in the black community, there was a lot of really uh, huge universes of influence. And I found, for, for me, it was my top ten. Three of them are white, seven of them are black. Uh, giants of the music that influenced and had a huge body of work, but also the, the musicians that came through the, the ranks that were discovered, that were uh, part-time members, uh, that released their own records and they had their own groups. It, it's really this incredible diaspora. And for me, I, I came to the Miles universe very much through Miles and out to the different records and you see the different Simon and you start finding out who Lucky Thompson is, who Sonny Stitt is. Like you just start working your way through the different artists from his, as a Simon. But I also, as I started buying labels, started buying a lot of artists that weren't connected to these various uh, artists that I knew. A lot of them are just completely anonymous names. I'm like, mm. but it's on this label, so I'm like, I'm going to buy it, get to know about it. And so I kind of did it backwards. I feel like if you had been in the 1930s, 1940s, 1950s, 1960s, you would have bought these records as they came out because you knew that they were affiliated with so-and-so. I've kind of gone the other way where I'm buying the record labels stuff. And then I'm, when I'm buying it, I'm, I do, then I do some research and go, oh, he was affiliated with so-and-so. And you discover there are certain names that keep popping up so frequently that the, it, it's just impressive the sphere of their influence in their universe. So today we're talking about Count Basie. Uh, Count Basie is a guy whose uh, career and discography becomes more and more immense to me all the time. And not just because of his own sales and his own albums. If anything, he's a better live performance than he is an album maker, but he does do a lot of great recordings. Uh, he, of course, goes back to the mid 20s. Uh, he's in Kansas City working with Benny Moten. Uh, he, he's right there at the beginning in the genesis of the real sound of swing. Uh, John Hammond, of course, discovers him and becomes fighting for him in his corner. And his recordings through the tw late 20s and 30s are some legendary swing. Uh, just a loose, rough, but hard as nails swing and organization. You know, uh, it wasn't the refinement of Ellington. It was very rough and loose and tumble. And uh, there's some drugs and bottle being consumed <clears throat> by these guys. And that's happening in Ellington's crew as well. But uh, it's, it's, it's a rough tumble of sound that actually becomes more refined with time. Uh, and I love... All, all eras of Basie for different reasons. Uh, like One O'Clock Jump and uh, uh, Jump Out the Woodside, to me, those songs are just universally powerful. I just love those tracks. But he does get into a small group era with Verve, uh, with Norman Granz. The economics of the business has kind of deterred him from doing the big group for a while, which he eventually brings back in the mid-early 50s and then he makes some incredible modern recordings for uh, Norman Granz on the Verve label, on the Roulette label. Uh, <clears throat> he has this pretty incredible body of work. And I put together all these photographs to show you here uh, just how much, he, how many records he's made. And this is just, this is probably half. You know, I got most of his Verve later stuff because he's the one guy from this era that Creed Taylor keeps on. Him and Johnny Hodges. Like he keeps both those two guys on into the later, more loungy verve of the mid-60s. Those guys keep making records, and they must have sold well enough to justify that because uh, they probably weren't what Creed Taylor necessarily had in mind. But uh, Bates' body of work is immense. You know, there's some Brunswick titles I'm missing. There's some Roulette titles I'm missing. There's some early Norman Grant stuff that I don't have yet. I've pieced a lot of that together between the clef and the, and the early Verve stuff. I have a lot of it. Uh, you know, this early clef stuff is really outstanding, you know. And some of this is small group stuff from the stripped-down group. 
one of the greatest rhythm sections of all time with Walter Page, uh, Benny, sorry, not Benny Green, uh, Freddie Green, uh, Joe Jones on the drums, and of course, the legendary Basie on the piano. Uh, looking at his orchestra over the years, as I started collecting the labels, it became so incredible to me the body of work that his side men accomplished. And a lot of these guys did this while they were still with Basie. Basie was very lenient and tolerant to you working on your own and you getting your own name established, your own groups established. Uh, you, of course, can record on your own. A lot of these guys have an incredible body of work. And they so often use Basie sidemen in their side projects that as I was digging into all these different labels, it was just astounding to me how many times I would find out, oh, this guy was a Basieite. Oh, he played with Basie. Oh, this guy was with Basie. It's, it's, it's crazy the size of the, Benny, uh, the, the Count Basie universe. And so what I did is I pulled out all the records I own by Basie Sidemen. And I took photographs of them. I'm going to show you here on this side. And it's a pretty incredible list of a lot of really popular names. And there's a few cases where I didn't uh, list show everything an artist did. Uh, like Ella and Billy, they both were uh, not big parts of the orchestra for any long, long period of time. I think Billy was there. Uh, I don't think she ever recorded with him even. And she joins Artie Shaw shortly after that and then has a nightmare experience touring with Artie Shaw and pretty much resigns to staying in New York and being there. Of course, she knew where her drugs were and she knew who her friends were. You know, she wasn't going to ride in no construction elevator with a bunch of tools. That wasn't how Billie Holiday saw herself. And uh, we're listening to a fantastic Columbia 10-inch here, The Dance Parade. And it's pretty standard, straightforward uh, swing of the early 50s, you know. Uh, his Columbia stuff has a real pop, big sound to it compared to what he does with Norman Grand's at Clef in the, in the coming days and weeks, years. But uh, So as I d started digging deeper into these labels and discovering all these artists that had worked with Basie, you really, really realize how much of a a focal point, a black hole, a, a nexus of a certain universe. You know, I mean, the University of Count Basie has a lot of alumni, a lot of great graduates. And I'm going to first list off the names of some of the sidemen that I know who didn't get to make records as a leader on the preeminent jazz labels of the 50s and 60s. And I'm sure some of you will correct me on some of these, but as far as Blue Note, Prestige, uh, Riverside, uh, the West Coast labels, Argo, Emerson, Savoy, Bethlehem, Atlantic, uh, Impulse, all those major labels. Uh, these guys didn't make records that I know of. And I know them very well, but I, I haven't... And it's not to say they don't have records later in the 70s and 80s on labels like Concord and Milestone. There's a lot of labels at that point that were finding these old cats and putting stuff out in that era. And there's also stuff being recorded by some of these guys on smaller in between the crack labels. And there's probably even a few cats that have records on a Capitol or a Columbia or a DECA that I just haven't found yet. So I don't have complete discographies of those big labels because there's so much not jazz stuff in there. It's really hard to get a grasp on it. But anyway, Tommy Turrentine, great trumpet player. He's playing with the group in the probably the 50s and 60s. Uh, he plays on a lot of blue notes as a sideman, but not, he doesn't have a leader on any of the great jazz labels in that period for some reason. Uh, he does come have some records of the leader later. Uh, Jimmy Wilkins, the brother of Ernie Wilkins, he has no records I know of. Uh, the great Freddie Green, I, he has one record on RCA that I know of from this era, and I actually have it coming in the mail. I was hoping it would be here, but it's not. Joe Jones has a few records on Everest, which is a very small label that's, uh, I don't want to say it's a budget label, but it's I had one of those records coming in the mail as well so for being the greatest rhythm section of all time you know the great American rhythm section it's amazing Freddie Green and Joe Jones don't have more from this era Walter Page doesn't have anything that I know of the great bass player and uh, he probably at some point later in his life got to make 
some recordings as a leader somewhere, but it's not in the Blue Note Riverside this era with, from, that I know of. Um, Benny Morton, the great trombone player. Dickie Wells, the great trombone player. Sonny Cohn on trumpet. Uh, Sonny Payne, the drummer. Snooky Young, the trumpet player. Hot Lips Page, who was with Basie very early on. and wasn't really an official member, but he kind of did featured solos. and uh, he, was, he was in that early universe. Uh, Gus Johnson, the drummer, who probably comes along probably in the early 60s, I'm going to think, with Basie. He has no record as a leader that I know of at this point. Uh, Eddie Durham, the guitar player, uh, was also a big part of the arrangements, from what I understand. Uh, Chew Berry, the sax player, he has some records, but not on the labels I'm speaking of. Shad Collins, a trumpet player, Ed Jones, and Fred Wesley of Parliament, James Brown, and the JB's fames, played with Basie for a while. And if you don't see the link between swing, a hard driving swing, and the funk, you haven't listened very carefully. You know, there's differences, but if you know how to swing, you know how to be funky. A lot of it's about negative space and leaving room to, for it to breathe and having the few notes you do play have more impact. Uh, these are names of people who I, I'm going to be honest, I've maybe seen or read the names before on records or on, you know, bios and documentaries, but these aren't names I'm really that familiar with. Thelma Carpenter was a singer. Herschel Evans, a sax player. Earl Warren, a sax player. Floyd Candy Johnson, another sax player. Uh, Charlie Folks is a baritone sax player. Marsha Royal played the alto sax. And then Ed Lewis, who looks like he's a bass player. These are names I'm, I'm less familiar with. Uh, Adam Clayton was a bass player. came along with the Basie bands in the 70s and 80s. And the Basie band, even after Basie passed, continued to be an entity for a long time, led by other people, including Thad Jones. Uh, I think uh, Hank Jones might have, Nat Pierce might have led it for a little bit. Uh, I was watching a documentary about Basie the other day, and they were talking about, as great as Hank Jones and Nat Pierce were, they couldn't play like Basie. So that's one of the things you see here, is that there's not any piano players in this list to be found. But now we're going to dig into the guys that have a lot of records, or at least some records, as a leader of their own. And I've been showing you the Basie stuff, and it's a pretty incredible body of work, and it's probably two-thirds of it. You know, but there's definitely some roulette stuff and some verve stuff. And there's some probably early 30s and 40s recordings. Probably not 40s. Well, maybe. You know, but that 78-inch era is a lot tougher for me to have a grasp on. But I do have some collections from that period from Columbia and DECA and uh, MCA own some stuff. But uh, we're going to dive right in. We're first going to talk about the gals that sang with Basie. And, of course, Billie Holiday's there pretty early on. And then Helen Holmes comes in, and she sings with the group for a long time. Uh, she, he, he does a couple of records with Ella at points and backs her up. And he was a really important guy in that aspect. And he, he, he was chosen by so many artists to have him and his group give this record some necessary oomph. I don't want the Hollywood Orchestra. I don't want the soft infill. I want some serious bang, some dynamics, some thrust, and Basie and company knew how to give that to any session. Uh, the main male singers for him at this point uh, would, of course, have been Jimmy Rushing, who was a giant of a man, uh, Joe Williams, who was a tall, slender, uh, debonair, well-refined singer with a lot of clarity and a lot of gospel and... Uh, just refinement and Jimmy Rushing was more of a blues guttural uh, gutsy singer and there's some footage from uh, Newport where they're actually on stage together which I hadn't seen till recently and it's fun seeing Jimmy Rushing being like the preacher the reverend stating out a sermon and then Joe Williams coming to the mic and putting that hallelujah on the top almost like the choir or one of the deacons validating what the reverend's saying uh, their styles are very different, but it made, makes for a very interesting mix. Uh, Big Joe Turner also sang on uh, with Basie at a lot of events and shows. I'm not sure how many recordings Big Joe Turner was on. John Michel can probably inform me on that. And I'm sure, I apologize right now, John Michel will be able to uh, correct a number of things that I'm overlooking here. But again, the universe is so massive. We're just kind of moving through it. Uh, and then we're going to talk about his work with pop singers. You know, uh, Sinatra, Tony Bennett, uh, 
the little Rat Pack guy. Uh, Sammy Davis Jr. Uh, Prisic, he makes a record or two with him. Uh, he's with a lot of the great male singers. He's he's in demand, you know, and they manage to find work, which is fantastic. So the singers, it's kind of a who's who of some of the great blues and jazz singers of all time and some of the great pop singers of all time. Uh, we're going to move on now. Lester Young. Uh, here's some of Lester Young's LPs. Of course, Lester Young is one of the great players of all time on the tenor. Just a wonderful narrator and storyteller. And he does... He's one of the leading guys in the field. His work with Billie Holiday is just giant. And he's absolutely a firm member of the Count Basie constellation. Uh, the next guy we're going to look at here is uh, Lucky Thompson and Wardell Gray. <clears throat> Neither of them have huge bodies of work. Uh, Wardell passes away pretty young. I think it was from an overdose. And Lucky Thompson, I think he was in Europe for quite a long time. And I think he was actually quite an alcoholic, if I remember, if memory serves. I apologize if I'm incorrect on that. But he didn't record as much as, as you would have thought for a guy that played with who he did and had the pedigree that he did. Uh, Lucky Thompson, there's not a lot of, available of, of him on the American Great Jazz labels. ABC has a couple. Uh, Don put something up, which I think was actually from Europe. Uh, Illinois Jacquette. As I said in my sax series last summer, Illinois Jacquette's one of the most important players of, of the tenor saxophone. He's that link between Ben Webster, Coleman Hawkins, and Dexter Gordon and Sonny Rollins. Illinois Jack has a very important figure. Uh, a lot of his work's going to be on Clef Norgrand and Early Verve. Uh, he has some stuff on Epic. Then he does some great stuff on Argo, which you'll see in the photographs here. Uh, I think he has a great record at, did I say Roulette already? He moves around quite a lot, and he, he suffers some from the labels he's at. You know, more peripheral jazz labels in a way. Uh, Epic's not really a great jazz label, but when he gets to uh, prestige in the, in the mid to late 60s, he makes some great swing and soul uh, jazz there that's really strong stuff. And I was just watching last night uh, Illinois Jack Kent playing with Dexter Gordon at the North Sea Jazz Festival back in 1979 with Buddy Tate and Bud Johnson and. Oh, it was one more too. It was five sax players with Hank Jones. It was a, it was fun. It was it was live, so there, there were some mic issues and stuff. But those guys were churning out some fire, no question. That was Buddy Tate. It was Bud Johnson, Arnett Cobb, and Arnett Cobb looked like he wasn't in the best of health. They had to help the brother up to the microphone. His mic wasn't working initially, but the cat was still blowing. Like he's like barely moving, but his fingers were doing just fine. Uh, it was fun to watch. Uh, after Illinois Jack Kett, we got the great Ben Webster. And Ben Webster is one of the greatest tenor players of all time. One of the most breathy, uh, just a beautiful player. And his work on ballads is just a legend. His work with the great singers is fantastic. Uh, again, a giant of a man and a guy that drank all the time and probably passed early, earlier than he could have had he lived a bit of a healthier life. Uh, next, we're going to look at Sweets Edison and uh, crap. Buck Clayton and Sweets and Buck do a record or two together as well. Uh, great trumpet players, just full of fire. Uh, Sweets is one of the sweetest tone players that the world's ever known. Uh, just uh, He's on so many records as a side guy, including uh, st stuff by like uh, Sinatra, I think Peggy Lee. He shows up in a lot of places as a side guy. He got a lot of work in the, even pop settings in the 50s. Uh, Sweets Edison doesn't have a huge body of work as a leader. But uh, he does do some great stuff for Verve and Norgran and uh, Clef. Uh, maybe just Verve. But uh, I don't have enough Sweets Edison. And these are some of the guys that I've been actually filling in the last year the Roy Aldridge's, the Sweet Edison's, the Ben Webster's. Again, they're not part of that 60s universe, 50s universe that the Coltrane, Miles Davis, Herbie Hancock jazz fan really cares about. But these guys are all such giants and architects, and it's all so interwoven and interlinked. 
And these guys made some very modern recordings uh, long before the modern jazz that we think of came into the fore. Uh, uh, Sweets, Edison, Buck Clayton, and then Don Bias, another fantastic player, a guy that was very instrumental in the development of the bebop and the modern sound, uh, a guy that was had some issues. He ended up going to Europe himself and became almost a forgotten entity. He's a member of Basie's group. I believe it's in the 40s when Bias was there. Uh, then we're going to talk about Buster Smith, uh, Bud Johnson, and uh, Buster Smith, Bud Johnson, and Buddy Tate. It says on my paper, Buster, Bud, and Buddy. It sounds like a burger joint or some kind of a arcade. Buster, Bud, and Buddy. Buster Smith is a great sax player who was the, instrumental in their development of bebop. He comes along early in the history of Gone Basie's group, and he's there at the very beginnings, really. And it's him playing double time and triple time in a very fluid way that Charlie Parker heard as a young guy. Uh, Buster Smith doesn't stay with the group too long from what I remember, and he only makes one really great record at Atlantic from that era. But Buster Smith is an important name and a real innovator that's very overlooked by today's collectors and the people who are into jazz. Uh, Bud Johnson's a great Texas tenorman, along with Buddy Tate. They both play the blues. Uh, a lot of the Texas tenorman would use a reed from a sax one size bigger. So if you were an alto, you use a tenor reed. If you were a tenorman, you would use a baritone reed. And those bigger, thicker reeds gave that real full Texas sax sound. And it was something that kind of Illinois Jack Cat and some of these guys started spreading around. And all these Texas players started doing it to kind of mimic that full tone. But again, three great players that you kind of come to as a collector. You know, Buddy, Buddy Bud Johnson, Buddy Tate, uh, Buster Smith, that record. You don't see that one very often on Atlantic. Next, we're going to talk about Paul Kinnishet, uh, or Paul Quinnishet. Uh, great uh, player, really mimicked. The fantastic Lester Young a lot. That's why they called him Vice Prez and a member of some of the great Basie orchestras. Uh, another great player that's sadly often overlooked by today's collector. It's not like one of those guys you buy a record by him and you oh, this guy was a big Basie guy. And he does a couple of records even on on Prestige that were exactly that, Basie reunions. And those are great records with a lot of the great players from those 50s bands. Uh, Lockjaw Davis, another super important cat. Uh, one of the guys who didn't really have a lot of formal training, if I recall, he's from the New York area. Uh, he just plays the blues from his gut. He's not one of those guys that read music and uh, sat down trying to refine this music and language or sit down and even worry about arrangements and uh, composition. He just wanted to tell you a story with his horn. He just wanted to get it off his chest. Lockjaw's got to be one of the most relaxed natural blues players in the canon. He's just a super basic down-to-earth player. And when you hear him play with guys like Johnny Griffin who are technical and really finite, Lockjaw's just so kicked back. He's, yeah, he's got to slip some beans up off his plate and pork in between notes. Like, he's just... Lockjaw's the deal, man. I'm, I'm, I'm becoming a bigger Lockjaw fan all the time. And so Lockjaw's another one of those guys where you start collecting his records, and you're like, oh, he's a bassy guy. And the list just keeps going on and on. Uh, Frank West, a great player, a wonderful uh, fl flautist, and a great sax player as well. Uh, he does a lot of work with the Basie f family and makes a lot of uh, fantastic records on Savoy, on Prestige. Uh, he also uh, was an important arranger, if I recall, with some of the Basie groups, if, I, if memory serves me. I'm a big Frank West guy. I love his body of work. They're really to be sought after. Again, a guy that plays the blues. Um, Thad Jones, a Blue Note guy. And a lot of these, a lot, a lot of these guys do leak, leak over to Blue Note. Because I remember this time, these guys were older men. And Blue Note doesn't pay. Blue Note was not a pay label that paid you very well. It was a very small label. If they paid you the, as good as they could. But if you could work for Norman Grands, that was where you wanted to be as Ben Webster or Coleman Hawkins or Sweets Edison. Norman Grands was going to take care of you. He came from money. Um, I think Jean Michel told me his family was lawyers in the LA area. Uh, he had a great empathy for the black condition and the experience. 
and took great care of his musicians. You know, Norman Granz is a guy deserving of a lot of recognition. He truly is. And uh, Thad Jones didn't work at Norman Granz. He, he went to Blue Note and uh, kind of went more the modern uh, post-bebop sound. He was never really a hard bop player and he could play bebop, but he was always still kind of more rooted than the blues and swinging hard. And he can play very dynamically and every bit as modern as any of the other players, but he's, he's just a little bit under the radar. You know, I'll listen to Thad Jones over Miles Davis in the mid fifties almost every time. Those three blue notes he does are outstanding. Uh, I'm a big Thad Jones guy. Most of his body of work is really, really high level stuff. And he works with a lot of the greats. And yet another name that you're just like, wow, that Basie's universe was so immense. Uh, next guy I want to talk to you about is Frank Foster and Jimmy Forrest. And Jimmy Forrest is, a, again, a fantastic tenor player with the blues dripping from him. He has soul. He has gospel. I love the way he tells the story. Uh, his five records at Prestige are all outstanding, and he utilizes some of the bassy guys with him on all of those recordings. I'm a huge fan of Jimmy Forrest. I've gotten more and more into his records as time has passed. He's just a great player that I can enjoy whenever I put him on. A bassiite. Frank Foster. Uh, his record at Savoy is really good. His stuff at Blue Note is really good, uh, which it comes a bit later. I think it's even after the sale, his record at Blue Note. He has a couple, I think. Uh, I'm a big fan of Frank Foster. He's He shows a bit of Simon in a lot of sessions that I'm a real big fan of. He doesn't have the hugest body of work, but Frank Foster was the real deal. And he's like, another one of these cats that was with Basie for years. Thad Jones was coming back to Basie's group for years. You know, so they never really severed the tie with Basie. It was a door pretty much always left open. All of his men seem to have such praise and love for him. You know, and that's outstanding. You want to have, you want to work for a guy that's fun to be around and not too intense and stressful. I'll tell you this much. Most of these cats wouldn't have worked with Miles Davis or Charles Mingus for 20 years. Ain't no Sweets Edison or no Ben Webster or Illinois Jacquette going to be told by a Mingus what to do in that cold, callous sense and, and be looked at like you're an idiot. You know, uh, Basie was great at communicating. He he would never insult what you did. He would just suggest, that's not how I heard it. That was interesting. Try it the way I heard it, then we'll see what's, which we like better. You know, he was very good at working with his guys, maintaining their egos. Uh, they all seem to love him so much. And the thing is, Basie was a pretty soft-spoken guy. That's one of the things that kind of shocks you because his music is so bold and dynamic and full of force and life and power. You would think he would be this spectacular personality, full of fireworks and piss and vinegar, but he was very almost shy. You know, William Basie wasn't a guy that wanted to spend... And he almost... He almost seems uncomfortable in interviews especially if you start talking about him that's that was shocking to me uh ellington has some of that too ellington ellington was more coy though i don't think ellington minded talking but he wanted to kind of talk around you like uh ask you a question back and make you think about what you just said ellington's kind of coy with his responses basically just seems like a little uncomfortable a little bit uh I'd rather not talk about me. Can we talk about the guys in the group or the arrangements or, you know, not me, uh, which it's not who I thought he was at first. He seems flamboyant when he's out there arranging his group and smiling ear to ear. You think he's going to be just this uh, tickle bomb, but he definitely wasn't uh, that perception. Uh, so these guys' bodies of work, man, Frank West, Dad Jones, Lockjaw Davis, Paul Kinnish, Illinois Jack Cat, just huge bodies of work. Uh, the two Joes, Joe Newman and Joe Wilder, both played with Basie. Wilder wasn't there as long from what I can tell, and we talked about Wilder quite a bit lately, his work on Savoy, his two Columbia records, and anytime you can find a Joe Wilder's rec a record with Joe Wilder playing the trumpet, especially in a pop setting, he's one of the most lyrical, beautiful, uh, muted, melancholic players I can ever even tell you about. I'm a huge Joe Wilder fan, and anything with him on, I'm like, ooh. 
yeah, I need to have that. And then Joe Newman's a little bit more fiery, uh, a little bit more full of life and, 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 and spritz. But he's also a great ballad player. And Newman plays on with a lot of bassy stuff. And Newman has a fairly big body of work as a solo artist. I don't have a lot of it. A lot of it was on RCA, if I recall, and Corral. Labels I haven't dove into as much because those labels are more for white cats. And so it's part of why I haven't dove into RCA as deeply. Newman's one of the few brothers on RCA and Coral that I can think of. You know, uh, it's mostly the, the, the territory of the Alcones, you know, and that stuff's great too, but uh, it's just not a label I've said. RCA has a lot of bad music, to be honest. And it's pop, schmaltz of the day, but a lot of that stuff hasn't stood the test of time. And that's one of the great things about the black canon. Black music, when you out, you're out about digging through records, most of what you find by black people, like I'm saying a really high, high, high percentage, has going to have a level of integrity and a sense of struggle and uh, a joyous release of being able to do this for a living right now. Black music has value. It's, it's also very rare. It didn't sell nearly as well. And it's almost always worth grabbing music by black people from the 50s and 60s. It's, it's always going to have some soul to it. And there's a lot of white, schmaltzy stuff that was kind of pre-packaged, preserved meals, meant to be as digestible to as many people as possible, darling. It's a wonderful session. I just, it's, man, again, there's so much schmaltzy, even jazz, easy listening jazz, a vocal jazz that's just nauseous with how uh, packaged and sweet and sugary it is. No soul whatsoever. No grit, no guts. The Wilder and Newman, both fantastic, both of the Joes. Al Gray, Billy Mitchell. I learned of Al Gray through Argo. His records at Argo are a splash of fantastic. Just a joy to be a part of. And he's one of the great muted trombone players of all time. And he's a virtuoso just this side of Jimmy Cleveland. But with the mute, there's no one better. And he does sounds and makes tones and warbles and whistles and whispers and shrieks and shouts and bending, twisting sounds. I've heard him do things. I'm like, I can't believe a trombone is doing that. It's just insane that you're doing that, Al Gray. You know, and Al Gray's another guy that shows up as a side guy quite a lot, especially with bassy groups. And then he does a couple records with Billy Mitchell. And Billy Mitchell also has a couple great records on the Smash label, which is affiliated with, I believe, Emerson, Mercury, if I recall. It's out of Chicago Smash. I think it's an Emerson Mercury subsidiary. But those two Billy Mitchell records I have are both outstanding. He does a couple of records where he's co-leader with Al Gray. And these two, both Basieites, when they're throwing down thunder on sax and trombone together, that's what swing is. That's what swing looks like. And... They take it into the modern era with such a dimension of joy and fun and love. Uh, you, re, you can really tell Al Gray was a guy. Al Gray was a guy that was probably a lot of fun to be around. You probably didn't want to cross him on a bad day because he's got that little look of. I mean, when I'm when I mean it, I mean it. But when I'm playing, when I'm clowning, I might pull your pants down. I might just be here to uh, just tickle you, annoy you. You know what I mean? I've heard he's yeah, I've heard he's quite a character. And the facial expressions he even makes in the interviews, he's just hes just one of those cat cats that you, I think would probably be a lot of fun to be around when he was in the mood to be around you. Uh, Billy Mitchell, I don't know as much about him person, personality-wise, but he's a great player. And again, a, a real purveyor of the blues and the sounds of the Basie Orchestra. Clark Terry. I've always thought of Clark Terry as predominantly an Ellington guy. And he did play with Ellington. But he was also a bassy guy. He was a big part of a lot of great bassy uh, horn sections. And out of St. Louis, Clark Terry is a giant of a player. And a lot of people kind of overlook his work, which I'm a little mystified by, because he's a serious player. He's bright. He's bluesy. He's dynamic. He has a sense of humor. Uh, his, his work on Riverside is outstanding. I really believe those are great records. His stuff on Impulse has a bit more uh, production stylized. Chico Ferro, we're going to make a record kind of Latin sounding, you know what I mean? But his, his stuff on Riverside feels very integral and beautiful. And his early work on Emerson and that early Argo of his 
Those are tough records to find, especially at Argo. That's a tough record to come by. And Argo didn't have the distribution that Emerson Mercury had. Uh, but you gotta love Clark Terry. And I really think he's an important part of the Ellington Basie into the modern age. And it's just crazy to see how interwoven the guys from the 30s into the 40s and the Warriors and the 50s with the moderns and how guys like Coleman Hawkins were right there watching the change, being part of the changes. Body and soul changes jazz as much as anything Parker did. And I think that's known, but it's also kind of overlooked in a way. There's little in jazz more modern than Body and Soul from 1939. You know, it's a really important recording where Coleman Hawkins sets the world on its edge. And then he comes back after the war and hires Thelonious Monk from being hanging out at Minton's. He knows what this Monk cat's doing. This is going to be new. He has a sense ahead of the time that this is this is the direction. So Hawkins deserves a lot of credit. So the link between these, it's not the gulf that people think it is. You know, post-bebop modernism and small group jazz from the, the swing era aren't that different. What they were doing afterwards, jamming in the clubs, it's all kind of very interwoven. And the one thing that does have a gap is the pop swing. You know, the Dorseys, that stuff's very languid and swingy. Uh, Glenn Miller, that was meant to be very much for the white uh, adults at home. Their son might be off at the war. Glenn Miller went to the war and, you know, he disappeared, of course, over the English Channel. But that's a very different style of swing than the stuff we're talking about. Um, Idris Suleiman, a great modern trumpet player who plays on a lot of very important modern recordings, especially at Prestige. He was a member of the Basie group for a while at this point. Uh, the great Curtis Fuller. The great Curtis Fuller. He's uh, a guy that played with Basie later. You know, so uh, Basie doesn't always necessarily discover these talents, but they always still want to work with that band if they get the chance. So some guys come to Basie very early in their career. Uh, some guys come to Basie kind of as they're ascending. Some guys come to Basie after they've kind of already done their solo thing, and now they're ready to kind of do something uh, maybe more sustainable, maybe more profitable. But he fuller joins the Basie group and plays with them through a lot of the 60s, from what I remember. Uh, and, I, of course, we're all big Curtis Fuller fans, and Curtis is still with us. Uh, there's a guy that I would love to have, sit down and have a chat with, he seems a pretty quiet fella from his photographs and from what I can tell, but you could be very wrong about some of that stuff as well. Uh, Paul Gonzalez. There's another guy that was part of the Ellington firmament, and I didn't think of him as a Basie guy. As I did my research, I'm like, well, Paul Gonzalez was a very important member of the Basie groups and played with him for quite a long time. Louis Belson fills the drum chair and he lays down that thunder for that Basie orchestra uh, not a lot of white cats in the Basie group over the years uh, Buddy DeFranco was one of them you know uh, Louis Belson was another uh, Serge Chaloff was another the great baritone player out of Boston he plays in the orchestra for a while and is a fantastic leader but uh, there's a lot of a lot of players that play through this group over the decades. Anyway, so many great players. Benny Powell, Henry Coker, uh, Buddy DeFranco, Vic Dickinson. It's a pretty long list here. I'm having a hard time. Matthew Gee plays in this orchestra for a long time. It's a pretty outstanding uh, body of work. And so when you look over all the names I've read to you, you know, and... There was the early list of names I knew that didn't have records as leaders on these labels. There's the list of names that I was honest, I didn't really know very much about. And then there's this list of incredible guys that do have this large body of work on these labels. And we're looking at such a huge part of the canon. I'm showing you over 200 and some records here that I took the time to pull out and photograph just to give you the immensity of the Count Basie universe. And What's even crazier about that is once you take the diaspora of the Basie Orchestra and then you factor in 
all of the sidemen that played with Basie's sidemen. That web intrinsically, intrinsically stretches out so much even broader than what we're talking about now. This is like first generation Basieites and their body of work and Basie's body of work. And I didn't show you Ella's stuff. I didn't show you all Billy's stuff. You know, I didn't show you a lot of these people were influenced. And even, even like uh, Ahmad Jamal was very influenced by Count Basie's playing. That minimal approach, that uh, contemplative, rhythmic groove. And then Ahmad Jamal, believe it or not, was a big influence on Miles Davis. Miles Davis at one point recognized Jamal's playing with the space and the groove and the openness as a thing that he could probably do very well. So Miles was influenced by Ahmad Jamal, and Jamal Jamal was influenced by Count Basie. Uh, another interesting record is Hambert, uh, Lambert, Hendrix, and Ross does a record, sing a song of Basie. And Basie returns that favor and brings them on one of their sessions. But Basie was, it's, it's just so much more even universal than what I'm showing you. And I've shown you a lot. It's a huge body of work. I took all day yesterday pulling these out and, and taking photographs just because I wanted people to see how broad this universe, this kingdom is. And how consistently, as I am sitting, doing my research, learning about artists, you go, oh, this guy worked with Basie. So that's the Basie universe. It's a very incredible place. And it, you, you learn a lot when you realize how interconnected the players of the modern age were to the swing age. And if you came from Ellington, if you came from Basie, you might have gone through Dizzy's group for a little bit or uh, Billy Eckstein's, but eventually the post-bebop post stuff happens and these cats are all still there. And because most of them are working for Norman Granz, a lot of us kind of overlook them, but there's nobody in the Blue Note camp that wasn't influenced by Ben Webster and Sweets Edison and Roy Eldridge to some degree. These guys are very important, very integral, and deserve all the recognition we can give them. So Basie Universe, it's it's going to be tough to top it. You know, Ellington's gonna have a big universe. Uh, I have a list of 10. I'm curious to see if you guys wanna see more of these. I'm also gonna see how much people watch it, because I'm definitely putting more time into this one. If the viewership's strong enough, and people are watching it for a long time, I'll maybe do another one, maybe do all 10. We'll see how it goes. Thanks again to my friend Jean-Michel. I'm hoping to make that a semi-regular thing where once every couple of weeks I'll share one of his stories with you. Uh, I eventually want to start interviewing him myself and having conversations with you with him and sharing those with you guys. Uh, again, I'm so technically savvy and I'm hesitant to even learn sometimes. And I'm also busy. I'm, I'm homeschooling two teenage boys, cooking their meals, keeping the house clean, keeping my wife's laundry done. I got a lot of things to go to do every afternoon. You know, uh, she has been having a weird sleep pattern lately, which has allowed me to have a little bit more time in the evenings to watch some jazz documentaries. Uh, so I've been enjoying that, soaking that stuff in. Uh, what an incredible legacy we here or all here gathered to talk about jazz. What a gift that just gives and cleanses and purifies the listener, and even helps us straighten out our emotional state in this world. Y'all be safe. Give me some feedback. Let me know what you think of this. Uh, we'll talk to you all soon. Thank you for all my Patreon supporters. If you want some merchandise, there's some cool Jazz Shepherd. Uh, check out the, the two Facebook pages, Jazz Vinyl Club JVC. It's a great Facebook group with thousands of members with a lot of play, people who answer questions for you. Uh, it's a great place to share your records and talk about jazz. It's a big community. And then I'm also, I also moderate and uh, I'm leader of a Blue Note jazz group record that's got probably 7,000 members in it. So again, you can share your Blue Note stuff there, your Blue Note stories, your Blue Note questions. They're both groups worth uh, checking into. I'll try to put links below if I can remember today so you can just join them up and be part of that great community. It's great to be around fellow jazz heads, especially during this pandemic and these lockdowns and these isolations, to have people to talk to about these things, it's good for us. Y'all be safe. Peace.